Imagine a world where someone made modern day Star Wars, but worse. Well, you better stop imagining because you're living in it, my guy. <laughs> Today we're talking about Zack Snyder's Rebel Moon movies. These movies are so weird. They're the typical hero travels around and meets people to join their squad to fight against the big baddies, but done in the sloppiest way imaginable. It's like the movie version of Mass Effect if you dumbed them down and made them a lot worse. I hear that the versions Netflix released weren't Zack Snyder's original vision. Apparently there was a lot that was cut out of these movies. And oh boy, it shows. This weird universe that Zack Snyder thought up shares a lot of parallels with Star Wars. Except without the cool stuff like Jedi, Sith, the Force, etc. They try to put their own version of lightsabers in these movies, but they're not nearly as cool. They're just like glowing regular swords. <laughs> I'm just confused why Zack doesn't just make a TV show. You know what I mean? He's obsessed with making these long drawn out stories with a lot of characters, lots of content, but he wants to jam it into a movie. I'm not saying that's impossible. With a very skilled writer, you can do that. I don't think Zack Snyder's a skilled writer. In fact, I know he isn't because I've seen these movies and I'm not a fan. I'm just gonna come right out and say it. These movies suck. If this guy wanted to make two three and a half hour movies, why didn't he just make a TV show? It would suit it so much better, I think. Snyder himself has a writing credit for a good deal of his movies, aside from his favorite of mine, Watchmen. I like that. Let me get the few compliments I have for these movies out of the way. I think the music is pretty cool at times. The visual and special effects were very well done, especially how much heavy lifting they did in these movies. They're mostly pretty good looking movies. Movies. You gotta hand it to Zach. He's a visual director. He knows how to make things look good. Just keep the pens out of his hands. Ah! Also, the acting was pretty decent throughout both movies. There's an accompanying short on Netflix named Creating of Rebel Moon. And one person during an interview said this. One of the things he's super great at is world building. Is he though? Why would you say he's great at world building? I feel like that's such a random thing to say. He hasn't really proved himself, has he? He tried with these movies and I think mostly failed. I mean, look at the scores online. I think I think Zach might have had too many yes men around. So whenever he pitched an idea, they're like, oh my God, that's so epic. We should definitely do that. And then they just tossed everything in. And if you were to compare this movie to a dinner, you would get the most confusing meal ever. <laughs> <laughs> Yummy. This video is brought to you by Displate. Imagine this is a poster. Oh, shit. There it goes, ruined. But it was you. Now here's the dish plate of Harrison Ford from Blade Runner. Gah. That Bubba. it ain't ripping. <laughs> I don't know if I can say Boy. Get with the times, stop using paper posters. They're so easy to ruin, it makes no sense to buy them. You should instead use Displate. You see all the posters on my wall behind me? They're from Displate, and I love them so much. Just look at them, dude. I got New Vegas, Alien, Reserve, Bloodborne, blah, blah, blah. Dark Souls, Cowboy Bebop, Sekiro, Blade Runner, Ghost in the Shell. Displates are unique metal posters designed to capture all of your passions. They look super sleek on your wall and they take no time at all to put up. With three easy steps that take less than a minute, you can have a displate hanging on your wall. All you need to do is clean your wall with the wipes that come with your displate, put the sticky leaflets on your wall so your wall doesn't get ruined by the magnets, and then put the adhesive magnets on the leaflets. And then all you do is put the displate on your wall. And if you want to replace that displate with a new one, I mean, it's pretty easy. You just take that one off and put a new one on. There are over 2 million artworks available in the displate catalog, whether it be Star Wars, Marvel, Elden Ring, Call of Duty, Warhammer, The Witcher, Netflix. If you like something, then odds are Displate has it in their catalog. If you want a Displate, then lucky for you because it's the start of the summer sale. Use my discount link in the description or use my code Elvis to get 27% off one Displate or 37% off two or more Displates. Thank you so much to Displate for sponsoring this video and making my wall very fancy. Now back to the review. These movies are made by a nerd with money. Like a nerd has an idea and he's like, oh my God, let's make movies because I know how to make movies and they did that and this is what we got not gonna lie if I had enough money I'd probably do the same thing would my project be any better than rebel moon hell no <laughs> So I can't really bash him too much. And I have to admit that I appreciate that this is a passion project of Zack's. I know what it's like to have an idea and want to desperately make something. This project must have been that for Zack. And even though it failed in a lot of ways, 
I wouldn't want a universe without these movies in them because that would mean that Zack didn't try. And I think everybody should at least try to create things that they love, even if they don't pan out. And who knows, maybe Zack still loves these movies and to him, they're perfect. I'm just gonna tell you what I think of them. I also want to acknowledge the amount of effort that went into making these. They built the village of Velt from the ground up and it's pretty neat seeing how they did that, even though this village is basically just like little Viking village. I would have liked it to be a little bit more unique, I guess. If you're making sci-fi movies, then don't be afraid to get weird with the building and stuff, you know what I mean? Instead, they just like ripped a village straight out of the show Vikings, but it still looks pretty cool. I like these buildings. I like that type of architecture. Although I am very upset that there's no staff church. They actually grew and harvested the wheat that they used in the movie. The makeup and creature designs are pretty cool. And one of the drop ships in this movie was built from scratch. Like there's an actual sci-fi drop ship that they use in this movie. And I think that's pretty neat. On a surface level, this movie is just a bunch of cool stuff, but it's not cohesive at all. It doesn't make for a satisfying hole. In the beginning of this movie, a space <laughs> wormhole opens up to allow a spaceship through. We're introduced to someone named Senator Belisarius, and he's declaring himself regent of the mother world, which is the evil empire in this movie. And they're sending ships out all across the galaxy. And their objective is to crush any resistance that they might find. We're then brought to Velt. It's a moon that's orbiting this massive ringed planet. And the view from Velt is pretty sick. Just look at this. It's really cool looking, right? Scientifically, I don't know if that makes sense. If they were so close together, then this big planet would probably just suck up the moon with its gravitational pull, right? I'm not a scientist, but I think that's what would happen. For comparison, here's our moon's view of Earth from the surface of the moon. The Earth looks rather small, right? Now imagine if the Earth was as close to our moon as this ringed planet is to Velt. You see what I mean? But whatever, it looks cool and I'm all about the rule of cool. So I'm fine with it, you know? It's badass, it's allowed. And it's sci-fi, you know? We're then introduced to Korra, the main character. She's this mysterious woman with a dark past. At dinner, the people of this village are instructed by their leader, Sindri, to bang. <laughs> they're all hanging out in their longhouse because, you know, they're a bunch of Vikings. And he's like, let's all have sex now, yahoo! <laughs> because that's the only thing that these people do on their little moon to enjoy themselves. They're strangely technologically inferior to everybody in in the universe, I guess. And I'm talking like hundreds and hundreds of years of technological advancement. They are quite behind. We'll talk more about that later. So yeah, with the wormhole pussy and the guy telling everybody to have sex, this, this movie's pretty horny right off the bat. Korra is your stereotypical badass stoic protagonist with a dark past who can't find it in herself to love someone. She's closed off because of the trauma that she's experienced in the past. Why'd they dress Sindri, this sci-fi man, like an Irish farmer? They went all out with their creativity in different aspects of this movie, but not in the most important one. The most important place during both movies is just a random Viking village ripped straight from 1000 AD and plopped into this sci-fi world. If they had to make this poor little farming village on this random moon, why not give them unique clothing and their own unique buildings? And why do they have to grow wheat? Make them grow some other strange crop that isn't on earth. <laughs> Come on, dude. It's a sci-fi. Have fun with this stuff. I'm not saying that people can't eat bread in a sci-fi. Obviously they can. But then we're introduced to the bad guys who are basically just Nazis. Zack Snyder's just borrowing a bunch of random stuff throughout human history and plopping them into this sci-fi world that he created in his mind. And it's not like an interesting twist on something that exists in the real world. Kind of like Jedi Star Wars are similar to monks in some ways. Unfortunately, that's not the case in Rebel Moon. There are a few things here and there where I'm like, oh, that's kind of neat. Like these red clothes guys with the flat top hats. Those guys are pretty cool, but the main baddie is just a Nazi. They just gave him an SS uniform. <laughs> I know Star Wars kind of went a similar route, making the Empire blatantly fascist. And there are some outfits in Star Wars that are like very vaguely reminiscent of a Nazi uniform. But in this movie, it's just like, let's just take it and use the exact same uniform and change it 1%. We'll tinker with it just a teeny weeny bit. This Nazi leader is Admiral Atticus Noble, and he's played by Ed Skrine. I loved him in Taco Bell Fry Again. This is spicy! The Admiral is here seeking a rebel named Devra Bloodaxe. She escaped from one of Tolkien's books. The Bloodaxes are this group of rebels. And <laughs> 
It's pretty funny how this is literally just Star Wars. The Admiral tells Sindri that they'll purchase their surplus grain for three times the market value. Let's call you triple the market value, shall we? That's pretty nice of them. But Sindri lies and tells them that they don't have enough to feed themselves. He does this because he doesn't agree with their principles. He doesn't like the mother world. We will volunteer nothing. So he risks the entire village by lying to them. Instead of just making a shit ton of money for their village. With that windfall, you'll be able to buy plenty of harvesters. They could have made the money and sent it to the blood axes or something. Play the long game, but no, the Sindri guy is a bit of a moron. Not only that, he doesn't reply favorably at all to the Admiral when he speaks of the mother world. Instead, he just stares back at him with cold eyes. Oh my god, I don't fucking care. I forget if Sindri has his reasons to hate the mother world. He probably does. But still, you're basically begging this guy to punish you. There's a character named Gunnar, but his name is actually pronounced Gunnar. There's a man named Gunnar. Of course, this is the Gooning character because he basically just acts as Korra's simp the entire time. He follows this girl all around the galaxy and he nearly gets himself killed several times. Now, are you an edger or are you a gooner? You're sick. Now answer my question. Were you edging or were you gooning? So Gunnar, with his big wrinkly brain, decides to reveal to the Admiral that Sindri was lying. <laughs> He does this in front of everybody, instead of going along with the lie. In response, the Admiral beats Sindri's head in until he's dead. I saw that coming from a mile away. The village people are told that they have to have a shit ton of wheat for the mother world by the time that they return. A lot more than they could possibly ever grow. So much so that they wouldn't be able to feed themselves. We will starve to death. I want everything. And if they don't deliver, then they'll all be killed. Great job, Gunnar. And Sindri, but you know, rip bozo Sindri. The Admiral leaves behind a group of men to make sure that the village people don't try anything stupid and to make sure that they're on track to deliver this grain. In this universe, there are robots called Jimmies and one of them is left behind on this random moon belt to ensure that they get their grain. And this robot is voiced by Anthony Hopkins of all people. I am JC1435, defender of the king. Good morning. I mean, I do love his voice, so. One of the Mother World soldiers has an issue with the Jimmy, so he starts shooting it, potentially breaking the thing. Maybe he knows that that shooting it wouldn't do much to it. But ever since the king died that they once served, they now just do manual labor. I don't know why they couldn't just be reprogrammed. I guess they didn't have the capability to reprogram these robots. That's something in the programming. But they can go through pussy wormholes and travel across space. The commander tells the Jimmy to wash himself off by the river because he's dirty, but he's a robot. The movie just did this to give Jimmy the opportunity to speak to this random girl named Sam so they could connect a little bit before the soldiers... You already know what the soldiers are gonna do as a course. Cora is like, damn, this blows, so I'm just gonna abandon you guys. <laughs> she literally tries to leave them. She's like, oh, well, you're all definitely going to be killed by the motherland, so see ya. But she's eventually convinced to stay. Of course, Sam is sexually abused by the men. Cora runs in and saves her. And while she's killing these men, there's a shit ton of slow-mo and zero blood, not a drop. <laughs> She takes her blaster and puts it right up to this guy's jaw and shoots, but there's no exit wound, just a massive explosion. The Jimmy enters the room, and despite the movie telling the audience that they were programmed not to harm others, it shoots the commander in the head for threatening the girl he likes. So the programming wasn't the best. So these robots are like semi-sentient. You can order them around unless you push them a little too far, in which case they'll kill you. So now it's Korra's mission to find people to help defend the village before the Admiral and his Nazi friends return. She needs the help of her friend Gunnar to bring her to the Rebel General of the Blood Axes to ask for aid. Because I guess Gunnar has traded with these people before. So Korra's like, all right, you're kind of useful. You can come along and bring me to where I need to go. She has a lot of faith that she can convince these Blood Axes to help a random farming village fight against the mother world. <laughs> we then learn more about Korra. Her family was murdered when she was young and she was kidnapped by the mother world leader Belisarius when she was was nine years old. She was indoctrinated into their culture and then trained in combat by them. You see her right here with short hair? She's 18 years old. It's very believable, I know. So she fought for the mother world and she even had a lover there who died. And she tells all of this to Gunnar. She explains all this to him a little bit too quickly, I think. This is a lot of information for this guy to absorb and she just kind of vomits it all over him. They had like one cute moment on Velt and then all of a sudden she's like, all right, I'm 100% comfortable with you. I'm going to spell all of my secrets. <laughs> 
Cora and Gunnar find themselves in a Star Wars cantina. Like, there's literally no other way to describe this place. I'm not saying Star Wars owns alien cantinas, but come on. It's got like all of the same qualities as a Star Wars cantina. It's dimly lit. There's a bunch of different aliens everywhere. There's music in the background. There's a weird looking bartender. Oh, and I guess orcs from Lord of the Rings are in this universe too. Because I mean, just look at this guy. <laughs> In this world, they're called the Hawkshaw, and they're bounty hunters. Like, this entire race is made up of bounty hunters. So I guess they're kind of similar to the Mandalorians in Star Wars, but way less interesting and mysterious. The bartender is a droid with a shit ton of obviously fake candles melted all over its shoulders for some reason. you think there'd be an easier way to light up the place, aside from placing a billion candles all over the sky? <laughs> like, this is a sci-fi. Why are we using candles? People can space travel, but they're using candles. Candles? It's technologically all over the place. It's so confusing. There's a very strange encounter in this cantina between Azog the Defiler and Gunnar. Actually, this guy resembles the Goblin King from The Hobbit way more. The Goblin King grabs this guy's dick and demands him for sex. Like, what? is this movie. <laughs> Why is it so horny? I'm confused. <laughs> and in the weirdest way, too. There's sexual abuse, molestation, there's weird pussy wormholes. You got a strange mind on you, Zach. Korra stops the Goblin King, and he returns with his buddies, because this guy, he fucks who he wants to fuck. No questions asked. Immediately when the fight starts, it looks like Korra uses Gunnar as cover, although I think it was supposed to be her pushing him down to save him, but it didn't look like that. Of course, everybody here has pissed this aim, aside from Korra, the Goblin King has a sidearm, but he doesn't use it until practically all of his men are dead. <laughs> Korra asks everyone in this bar if they know where they can find General Titus. And General Titus is a pretty renowned leader to the rebels. At least he used to be. So she's basically exclaiming to this entire cantina that she's a rebel. And she seeks to rise up against the mother world. Not exactly the most covert operation, but you know, whatever works. There's a pretty cool parasite alien in this cantina. And it uses a human puppet to tell her where to find Titus. Jax from Sons of Anarchy is in this movie too. He plays a guy named Kai Sanat. You wanna know who I I don't like bounty hunters. I didn't ask. And he's got an Irish accent. Immediately upon meeting this guy, they tell him that they have a plan to fight against the mother world. <laughs> They're so moronically overt with their plan. It's so infuriating. <laughs> Kai Sinat is like, oh, sure, dude. Yeah, we can work together. Let's hop on my ship and fly away. I'll bring you where you need to go. They immediately trust this random stranger they just met. Also, Kai decides to help them despite them telling him they have practically no money to give him. This is not the one you get rich on. So why is he doing this again? Because he has a very strong moral compass, I suppose. He just wants to help out of the goodness of his heart. At least that's what Korra and Goon I believe. The dumbest people in the universe. They must be. At least she's good with a pistol. If you were to give this girl stats in like a Bethesda game or something, she would have one intelligence and everything else would be in combat, you know? Korra and Gunnar believe that this Kai person wants to aid them fight against the Mother World when he and everybody else knows that the Mother World is on this massive campaign to slaughter all of the rebels. And Kai is informed that they're fighting on behalf of a tiny little village in the middle of nowhere on a moon. Oh, I understand we're just simple farmers. <laughs> They're definitely going to stand a chance. And he flies them all around the galaxy too. He brings them to like five different planets. And it's not like these people have a ton of money to give him or anything. So he's paying for all this space fuel out of his own pocket to help these random rebels that came out of nowhere. Yes, I'm sure he has no ulterior motive. <laughs> The Nazi admiral smokes and has sex with an octopus creature through these little spots on his body. It makes no damn sense, but all right. They're like these little pleasure spots, I guess, because in the far future, this is how people want to have sex, you know? People just don't use their dicks anymore. This is the new way. Kai brings Korra and Gunnar to a plant named Nui Wodi. <laughs> or new Wody or something, I don't know. Where they find a man named Tarek. It's like Derek, but with a T. He's held captive as a blacksmith, and he's told to ride Buckbeak's evil brother, Blackbeak, or else Korra, Kai, and Gunnar are all to be slaves alongside him. It's kind of insane that Kai and Gunnar go along with this plan. We already know why Korra did, because her intelligence stat is in desperate need of improvement. I guess this Tarek guy is worth risking all their lives for. He's just that important. Is he worth our time? I think you'll like him. I'm 
gonna spoil it right now. He's not. He's not important at all. By the end of the movie, he just helps a bunch of farmers fight people, but he's shirtless with two axes. He's just as dumb as the rest of them. Although he does have a massive luck stat, so that helps. I want an alternate ending to this movie where Tarek fails to fly this thing, so all these people are now slaves to this random guy. <laughs> That's how it ends, I guess. They made a deal, right? Here we go. If that happened, at least it would be funny. It's pretty hilarious that Kai was like, damn, you guys definitely need a lot of support if you're gonna fight the mother world. And when I say that, I mean quantity, like you need a lot more people to fight. <laughs> So he brings them all the way to a plant to get this random slave to help them. If you're familiar with this movie, you might say, well, Elvis, he's not just some random slave. He's very buff. Have you seen his body? And he's very skilled with axes, did you know? He can talk to griffins too. It's very useful, except it's not. It doesn't come to play at all, ever again. His ability to speak and tame animals doesn't even come into play. He does it once during this one scene and then it never happens again. So pretend I'm Kai. Hey guys, I know exactly who can help. Oh yeah? Who's that Kai? He's got an interesting and dark past. He's very muscular and he's a slave. A slave? Yeah, but we can free him. We don't have any money. Oh, we'll, we'll figure that out when we get there. <laughs> oh, so you're just kind of like winging this shit, aren't you? Yeah, no plan. I have no, no plan really. Even if we do find a way to free the slave. You spent all this space fuel to get there. And you have to spend space fuel to leave and go elsewhere. All for this one guy? Is he that important? Does he have like an army waiting somewhere? Um, no, no army, just the one guy. Sounds like a plan, let's do it. <laughs> also, Gunnar explains their motive for being there in front of the slave owner, who could have an allegiance to the mother world, but I guess they've made a habit of spewing their plans in front of everybody they meet. So what's one more person? <laughs> so of course, Tarek can speak Black Beak's language. So he tames it and he rides it and they free him and he leaves with them. This part of him conquering this animal goes on for way too long. And of course, there's a lot of slow-mo because, you know, Zack Snyder. So Kai brings them to another random place, a Mars-like planet named Dagus. They're here to find more people that might help them. And by more people, I mean one more person. All of a sudden, Kai is super invested in Korra and Gunnar's problem back on this farming planet. By the way, they haven't paid him anything. He's just going along with their mission. And for some unbeknownst reason, Tarek doesn't ask any questions. He just goes along with whatever they're doing. Korra and Gunnar completely trust Kai for no reason, really. They just think he's a cool guy that will give him their spaceship to use for, um, ever. <laughs> no payment necessary. He's just paying it forward in the riskiest way possible, you know, fighting against the most powerful regime in the fucking galaxy. It is what it is. I guess Kai is putting all that space gas on his visa for these random people hoping that they'll pay him back one day. Or he will obviously betray them. It's not even a question like this guy is obviously going to backstab you. <laughs> oh my God. So if you haven't gathered this by now, Kai is going around the galaxy, gathering up all these important rebels so he can deliver them to the mother world for payment. Even a 12 year old could have seen this coming. I mean, <laughs> on this planet Dagus, they meet an Asian goth queen named Nemesis. Very dumb name, but a very cool hat. She asks them what the job entails and Kai is like, oh, nothing big. Just protecting a measly farming moon from the most powerful force in the galaxy. Galaxy. So far, we're doing great. We got a slave who can ride a griffin pretty well and two farmers. Things should go swimmingly. So she doesn't respond because, you know, it would be insane to join them. Guess what she does? Nemesis decides it's time to talk to a spider person who had kidnapped someone's child. She wants to try and convince this spider woman to give back the child instead of, I don't know, eating it or something. God, this movie's so random. Anyway, let's continue. She fails to convince the spider woman to give the child back. They start fighting practically out of nowhere. There's a moment when this spider woman has her pinned by her arm, but she kind of just sits there and waits, which gives Nemesis enough time to chop her leg off. Nemesis then heats her blades up, so they turn into mini lightsaber type things. Why didn't she do this earlier when the fight first began, I don't know. Well, I think it's just because Zack wanted to make it this epic reveal, like we haven't seen glowing swords before in a sci-fi saga. But Elvis, Star Wars is fantasy. I don't care. You I don't, don't care. care. Anyway, she cuts the spider's underbelly, but the spider doesn't feel it for some reason. When earlier, it was clearly reacting to the pain, but adrenaline, it's pretty crazy. The spider lifts Nemesis into the air and she just kind of lets this happen. The spider could stab her, she could stab the spider, but they have a small staring contest before Nemesis kills it. I don't think this is a point against the movie because I think it's very common in fights for there to be like a break or a pause, waiting to see what the other opponent's gonna do. But then again, do you know what happens in UFC when one 
opponent has the other one pinned. This is what happens. Right oh! So I take it back. Ding. <laughs> We're doing the Cinema Sense thing. Ding. <laughs> the spider was played by Jenna Malone and its name was Harmada. But I don't know why they decided to name the spider because they don't say the spider's name once in the movie. I know it took a lot of work to make the spider thing come to life in the movie. Like it was a combination of CGI and practical effects. It's pretty cool to see how they did this. But I would have loved to see this spider thing join the crew. Wouldn't that have been cool? <laughs> it definitely wouldn't have been cost effective. Probably not even possible, but still. It would have made the movie unique, at least. Give it this James and the Giant Peach vibe. Oh, and uh, now we're flying away to a different place because we spend like 15 minutes on each planet and Kai has endless fuel. Oh, and Nemesis joined the crew, by the way. But wait a minute, she didn't question anything. She just joined the crew? Well, you see, she joined the crew because Gunnar protected the little kid from earlier that the spider bitch was trying to kill. Oh, but she still had no questions about where they were going or what they were trying to do. Or... No, she just wants to take the job because she needs a job. But Cora and Gunnar have no money. So how'd they convince her? Just, just stop best. No, shh, shh, no, no. She joined because she would make the group cooler. That's the real reason. <laughs> People join this crew faster than pawns and dragons dogma. Just, oh, you're looking for someone? I'm in. It is a pleasure to meet you. <laughs> I love how they think adding one additional person per planet is gonna help them fight the mother world. <laughs> it's not like each of these people have an army waiting somewhere, which would have made it make a little bit more sense. Even in video games, that's normally how it works. You go someplace because you have this big mission and you need to gather forces. So you convince one person who's a leader of a bunch of other people to help you. And then later in the game, you see this person and their men help you fight against the big baddie, whatever it is. But no, in the Rebel Moon universe, one one man equals 300. You see what I did there? I'm very clever. <laughs> It would have been so much cooler if Zack Snyder was like, hey, they're gathering these like superhumans to fight the mother world. You know, people that equate to like Master Chief or Doom Guy. That way it would make a little bit of sense. You know, like these people, they're one out of a billion. They're just that good, dude. You know, give them some like sick armor or something. That would be pretty neat. I mean, in that case, they would overshadow Korra a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> but why not make Korra one of these people? I mean, she kind of already is in these movies. Even without any armor, she just survives. It's just dumb. Apparently, Korra had once served directly with the king and even became the bodyguard to Princess Issa. And this princess has this random ability to heal things. Like, she can revive the dead. Okay, so there's a healer class in this universe. But they never expand on that. It's just introduced and then, you know, that's it. She's a healer. There's no other healers or mages or any other magic. This is the one person in the entire galaxy, I guess, who can use like special abilities. She's the one X woman. <laughs> I know that's supposed to make her special, but it's just weird, you know? It makes no logical sense. Next, we're in a gladiator arena on the moon of Pollux to finally meet General Titus. I'm surprised that these people had enough time to travel all around the galaxy before the Admiral and his men showed up at Velt again. You'd think it would take a long time to travel between planets, and if not a long time, it would be very expensive, right? Because I'm guessing warping between planets would cost a lot of money. It's probably just very easy to do that in the Snyder Rebel Moon universe. Otherwise, it wouldn't make a lot of sense, would it? You know, I'm trying. I'm trying to like piece things together and it's, it's, I don't think it's working. General Titus is played by Jaiman Hunsu. I really liked him in the movie Gladiator. I think he's a great actor. So it's kind of cute, right? He's on a gladiator planet. Like this whole planet is dedicated to gladiators, I suppose. Kind of like Velt is the farm moon. They all have like very distinct things about these worlds. There's not much else going on on them, I guess. This general is a washed up homeless guy. They give him a bath. Cora says like three things to him. She's like, you want revenge, right? What about revenge? And then he goes, I, where are we going? <laughs> Actually, I don't even think he says that. I don't think he questions them at all about their plan either. All these people are just joining up with blind faith. It's ridiculous. Next, we see the Admiral interrogating someone about the Blood Axe's whereabouts. Afterwards, he kills him with this device that resembles those things you kill livestock with. Actually, this device more closely resembles this execution method where they sit someone into a chair and they crank something into the back of your neck and it's supposed to kill you instantly. In this universe, they have the same thing, but it's needlessly complex. There's this device that's inserted 
inserted into the back of this thing. And on a small screen, it displays what's about to happen. A sharp rod will puncture this guy's neck, killing him. But we see it penetrate his skull instead. So that's weird. Also, I'd like to mention that the Admiral's haircut is a crime in and of itself. Look at it. Awful. <laughs> now we're on the home planet of King Levitica, and the planet is called Sharon. This movie zooms around the galaxy more than the intro to Star Wars Episode Nine. Korra came here to visit the strangely Gungan-looking King Levitica. Oh, and guess what? Korra can speak this random language of Sharanese, so that's convenient. We then meet the Blood Axes. They have very cute face paint. Korra and Gunnar tell them that they need their help to fight the Mother World's forces, and in return, they'll get some grain. <laughs> Sure, countless of your men might die, but do you like bread? <laughs> We make a mean loaf. Actually, I don't even think they make bread for them. In this universe where space travel is very common, food must be very scarce if they have to travel from planet to planet to get some. This is even funnier when you realize that Velt already sold them grain. Like that's how Gunnar knows these people because he sold them grain before. So they really have nothing to give them that they wouldn't have already been giving them. Except this time it's free, I suppose. <laughs> yeah, risk all your lives. We'll give you a lot of flour. I mean, it's you you gotta do it, it's the principle. You gotta help us protect this random little village on Delt. It's important, okay? Who cares about the countless other places that the mother world is probably obliterating? Let's focus on this random little village on this little tiny moon that has what, like a couple hundred people on it? It's so dumb. The Blood Axes being one of the main rebel forces that are fighting against the mother world would most likely, if not definitely, have much more pressing things to do. Also, let's go back to the grain thing. 10 seconds earlier, the leader of the Blood Axes Devra told them that their food needs are being met by King Levitica. Oh my God. Korra tries to guilt them into fighting for them. Bold tactic, I must say. Devra's brother is like, I bet I'll go. <laughs> didn't take a lot of convincing. Also, I guess the dreadnought that visited Velt is called the King's Gaze, so I'll be calling it that from now on. But Korra never mentioned the ship's name to the Blood Axes. The Blood Axes just kind of guessed the correct ship out of thin air, so... And I'm guessing that the Mother World has countless other ships, unless they only have one dreadnought, which probably isn't the case. Also, this Blood Axe dude's delivery is so bad. <laughs> dreadnought of the Mother World. To stand against a dreadnought of the Mother World. They decide to help Velt based on their principles alone. I do kind of like the Blood Axe's justification for helping the farmers, but they decide on this way too fast. Is that not what we stand for? But this is a hell of a lot better than the other people on this crew that seemingly just joined up because they had nothing else to do. Kai then begs Korra to allow him to help them fight the Mother World. And still, Korra is completely blind to his actual motive. King Levitica's planet is burned and he's killed by the Admiral. Oh no. Poor King Levitica. I knew you for one minute and I'm not joking, I think it was actually one minute. Next, our heroes travel to Gondival, the unregistered trade depot. It turns out that Kai double-crossed them. Oh my god. Yes, of course he did. Who could have seen this happening? Oh no! It's kind of weird because Kai reveals to Korra that the mother world destroyed his home world. They didn't just destroy it. They tortured every man, woman, and child. So he decided to help them because they couldn't be stopped anyway. Why did they have to put that in? You know what I would do if this group of people destroyed everybody and everything I ever knew or loved, I would help them. <laughs> They're just too powerful, dude. Arthelaus is Korra's real name, by the way. Arthelaus. But I'm going to continue calling her Korra. Gunnar is instructed to kill Korra by Kai. So he inserts the Impaler into the slot and turns it. And I guess doing this releases her? How does this random farmer from Velt, a little moon that has no technology, know how to use this thing? He should not know how to use this. Also, why would Kai assume that Gunnar knows how to use it? Also, if this is the kill switch and the key to release the person that's, you know, held captive, then why would he give it to Gunnar and be like, just figure it out and kill her? <laughs> so Korra is released, and you guys already know that she's been leveling up her luck. Gunnar kills Kai, by the way. This is how he does it. Whatever. The Admiral misses every single shot at Korra. His aim is astonishingly bad. Like, this is the first time he's ever fired a gun. In fact, I think if this was his first time, he would still have better aim than this. <laughs> So everybody here was locked up in the same device, but somehow none of the mother world people decide to shoot the people that are, you know, locked up. They're definitely the easiest targets. Also, all these people managed to get released. They all managed to get free before getting killed. It's kind of a miracle. So then the blood axe leader and nemesis literally bring swords and a pole arm to a gunfight. I have no idea how they aren't killed immediately. Just kidding, I do. This is how they shoot. The blood axe guy is killed after sacrificing himself to take out the guy who's piloting the ship. The ship is no longer being 
being piloted, so it's dropping out of the sky. Look at how large this ship is. Are you telling me there isn't a single person on this ship that could take over for the pilot? I suppose there isn't, because it just drops out of the sky, and nobody does anything about this. Shouldn't there be like an onboard AI or like autopilot? If the ship is obviously off course and heading towards a collision, you'd think that something would stop that. Maybe there wasn't a single person on board aside from him. This is a cargo ship. It's just filled with Coca-Cola cans or something. This girl is very upset that her leader was just killed. So she starts shooting wildly. Look at how angry she is. God, she's shooting that gun so angrily. I'm sure she killed so many people right there. You just didn't see it happen. Cora's on one side, right? And the ship is coming down like this. And Cora is able to like slide under the ship and get to the other side because she's chasing the Admiral. She wants to kill the Admiral. But how did she do that? Do you see Damn, how thick boy. this ship is? During this one part, it must have slimmed down dramatically. Anyway, Way, she's dead set on killing the Admiral, who, luck would have it, lands on a tiny floating platform. Korra lands on it too, and they start fighting. During this fight, it's implied that Korra breaks his arm, but she really just bends it at the elbow, and it's pretty obvious that's what happened. She eventually kills him. His octopus sex days are over. Just kidding, he survives. <laughs> it's not a joke, he really does. <laughs> Everybody that was part of the original group survived, aside from Kai and that random blood axe guy. It's all very convenient. They go back to Velt, and instead of of landing their ship in the village, they decide to land it elsewhere so they can ride these tauntauns, sorry, Urukai, toward it. This is some Starfield shit. They land 15 miles out and then use these little horse things to ride all that way. <laughs> oh, the Jimmy bot is wearing antlers now. He's becoming one with the earth. So yeah, they're going to revive the Admiral after his fatal stabbing and fall from 10,000 feet. I mean, it's easy, right? Just plug him in. He's like a cell phone with low battery. <laughs> Just suck the bad goop out and put the good goop in and he'll be fine. It's just sci-fi stuff. It makes sense. The intro to the second movie is pretty funny to me. Poor Anthony Hopkins. They force him to pronounce all these weird ass names for made up people and planets over and over again. The narration in the beginning is meant to remind the viewer of the events from the first movie, but also catch up those who haven't seen the first. But come on now. The people who haven't seen the first movie aren't gonna watch the second. It's just not happening. You need to watch Rebel Moon 1. No chance. And even with this very brief explanation, someone who hasn't seen the first movie is not gonna understand anything that happens in the second. It's gonna be very confusing for them. They just get a bunch of random names and events plopped on their head and they're meant to absorb all of that before the movie starts. It's just not how people work, really. It's kind of like in the game Elden Ring. You know how when you start that game, you're given a bunch of random information, but it really means nothing to you until you finish the game and you've met all these characters that were introduced to you in the intro. And then you can slowly try and piece together the story. Well, they do the same thing for Rebel Moon 2 and I don't think it was all that necessary. If you haven't seen the first movie, things like like this aren't going to make sense to you. Sharon, Darian Bloodaxe, Lieutenant Milius, Velt, Floating Docks of Gondaval. It's just sci-fi word soup. So far, it's pretty clear that Zack Snyder nailed everything about making a cool sci-fi story, aside from the story part. Ah! Admiral Noble is pulled out of his healing cocoon. He tells his buddy old pal Cassius to set course for Velt so they can find and kill the Scar Giver. The Scar Giver set course for Velt. That's another nickname for Korra, by the way. The Scar Giver. They've got some pretty epic names in these movies. The Scar Giver, the Blood Axes, General Titus, Guna. <laughs> we learn that the people of the village have five days before the King's Gaze arrives to fuck them in the ass. I'm ready for our arrival in five days time. Everybody panic! Oh my God! Korra believes, justifiably so, that Admiral Noble is dead. Admiral Noble is dead. So she informs the farmers that they have nothing to worry about. The one remaining mother world soldier on the planet, he was the good guy of the bunch, okay? The only one of the group to survive the fight in the first movie. This guy has been communicating with the King's gaze, pretending that he's still on their side. All is as it should be, I trust. Yes, sir. All is on target. And he knows that the King's Gaze is still en route to Velt. So he informs them and they're like, oh shit, we're all screwed. General Titus speaks to the farmers and he's like, all right, y'all, better start bringing in that grain. You've got three days. Korra explains to Gunnar how the king was betrayed by Belisarius. And when they show us his Julius Caesar-like demise, there's literally violin players there playing the background music to the scene in the movie, which is an absolute insane decision. <laughs> I 
literally laughed out loud when I saw them. And they all used knives to kill the king because it has to be exactly like the Julius Caesar assassination or else people won't understand the reference. You know, Belisarius orders Cora to shoot the princess and his line delivery is so funny. Do it, kill her. How the fuck is this take in the movie? Unreal. The king unrealistically whimpering and dying in Belisarius' lap is almost just as bad. The violin player stopped just in time for the princess to say her line. Buy alien clothing. <laughs> Korra shoots her, and the princess turns into Mikola from Elden Ring. Korra just blasts a hole straight through this child. That's one way to make us like the protagonist. Belisarius attempts to use Korra as a scapegoat, like they try and blame the king's assassination on her, but she was able to fight her way to safety because I suppose all these people were only armed with knives. She's just that good. There's not one, but two farming montages in this movie. One here and one after the Admiral Scar scene. They're gathering the wheat by hand. I always think it's so weird when people use primitive techniques in a sci-fi like this. Cassius apologizes to the Admiral about the scar on his chest that was left behind by Korra, the scar giver. LOL. I wasn't really sure what they were talking about when they mentioned the scar, mostly because it's a circular scar and I mistook it for one of those circle body G-spots he reserved for his sextopus. It's kind of insane how little we know about the main cast of characters aside from Korra. Farmers give them all gifts. Each of them are given a small tapestry, each with a different design that are meant to describe each person's good qualities. All right, let me get this straight. These guys arrived here a couple days ago. The farmers hardly know these people, so it makes very little sense that they would have time to make these tapestries for them when supposedly they're meant to be gathering as much grain as humanly possible before the king's gaze arrives. So these farmers had the time to create these tapestries by hand and learn about each person during this very small time period when they were meant to be gathering a shit ton of wheat. Maybe there's like 80 hours hours in a day on belt. Even then, I don't know. It's hilarious how these farmers know more about these characters than I do. <laughs> the next day they start training by slicing up hay men with machetes. <laughs> there's a random abandoned dropship nearby that they decide to put to use. And it's the same type of dropship used by the mother world. Pull it out. It could be a powerful asset. 41 minutes into the second movie and we finally start to learn more about the characters. Except it's basically just one big info dump scene. Milius shares her story. Yeah, this girl, her name is Milius. You probably didn't know that. I wouldn't blame you. Her story involves the blood axe guy that was killed at the end of the previous film. Man, his death and her reaction to it would have been a a lot more impactful if we knew this information before he died. Of course, all of these characters have super tragic backstories. Why is it so hard for these people to create some characters without a tragic backstory? Would it have killed them to make one person with a backstory that didn't involve some sort of tragic event? I know they all need to hate the mother world for one reason or another, but still, they lay it on a little thick. When every character has a tragic backstory, then it feels like none of them do. I'll be honest, I lost interest in this universe halfway through the first movie, so. <laughs> At this point, I'm not very invested, but I knew I had to make a video. <laughs> Jimmy, the robot with antlers now, speaks to Korra, and it explains to her how it has felt directionless for a long time, because the king and princess it once served are both dead. So the king's gaze enters their orbit, and they send down a bunch of dropships, which deploy a bunch of walkers and soldiers. We are totally fucked. Admiral Noble gives Korra the option to give herself up, and in return, they will simply take the wheat and leave without killing anyone. But she would be idiotic to believe him, right? But we already established that her intelligence is level one. <laughs> She's like, you're right, I have no other choice. Or if she was in Fallout 1, she would respond like this. Oh good, yes, mommy. She signals her friends to stand down, and this old farmer drops his sledgehammer, so Gunnar takes her gun and shoots the bell to signal the ambush. <laughs> which could have easily resulted in both of their deaths. Bruh. That's one way to win over her heart, which he does, by the way. Before dying, that is. Oop, spoiler. The Admiral kills this farmer guy who nobody cared about anyway. And of course they have to put in slow-mo during this part, like it's a huge deal. We saw him for like five minutes in the beginning of the first movie. Hello. Tarek fights with two axes. What are you doing, my guy? What makes it funnier is that right before they rush out to fight, one of the farmers with distractingly white veneers yells, to fight and die, because he knows 
knows they're all gonna die. And then Tarek turns to him and he's like, well, I don't know about the dying part, but yeah, let's go. The music is pretty cool during Nemesis's fight scene, but there's just way too much slow-mo during this fight to find it enjoyable. It's literally most of the fight. I'm guessing the choreography was too sloppy to put it in real speed. Korra takes that random dropship and flies it up to the Dreadnought, disguising herself as one of the dropships that flew down earlier. Gunnar puts this little like smoke grenade in the wing so it looks like the ship is damaged. And the people in the Dreadnought are like, oh my God, that ship's damaged. Come on in. Shouldn't they have numbers assigned to the dropships or something? Technology is so advanced that they can travel between planets, but things like serial numbers and databases don't exist. Obviously, they should have some sort of way to know which dropships went down there and their status, right? I can think of countless movies where there's like these ships that fly in to some place. Even in the Halo show, during one of the final fights in season two, they have this big screen that shows the status of the ships and whatever, showing them very basic stuff like whether or not they're still active or destroyed, but not in this movie. For fuck's sake. They can't do that. Too complex. Anyway, these dumbasses are fooled by her, so Korra and Gunnar board this ship without an issue. They attempt to take down the Dreadnought from within by planting these futuristic explosive charges on the core. Where did she get these? Doesn't matter. Don't think about it. She always had them in her back pocket. They were in her inventory. Apparently, Korra walks right up to the core of the ship in the engine room without an issue. There's no guards, no locked doors, no access code, nothing. Easy peasy lemon squeezy. But what they do have are a bunch of guys shoveling coal into the engines. Like this is a cruise ship from the early 1900s. Holy shit, Nicholas, I'm flying. There's a scene when Tarek runs through the battlefield, totally exposed, and he's killing people left and right. But of course he's got that juicy thick plot armor. He doesn't have to worry about a thing. There's this ridiculous moment when Tarek and Milius stand up and start shooting at a large group of soldiers and all of the oncoming fire misses. Every single shot. What are they shooting at? Why aren't they shooting at the two people that are directly in front of them? The Jimmy with antlers pops up and starts fighting and basically wipes out the entire squadron by itself. He does it without a problem. It seems very easy for it. Damn. If only the dumbass mother world just created more of these robots, they would have no need for human soldiers or laser tanks. Korra's charges go off and the ship goes down. But while going down, there's gotta be an epic sword fight. Why are Korra and the Admiral fighting anyway? <laughs> the ship is plummeting to the ground. You're both dead anyway. And they fight while sliding down the ship. It's so silly. And then the ship is destroyed. I have to admit these two actors act their asses off. And while these movies are dumb as shit, I must applaud them for that. Gunnar saves Korra at the last second by stabbing the Admiral. Where the fuck did he come from? Whatever. They use a ship to escape the wreck. They have a rough landing and Gunnar is dying. Oh no. Hilariously, the blood axes show up at the last second to take care of the scraps. Better late than never, I suppose. You can tell that they were trying to do the whole look to the east, Lord of the Rings Gandalf thing. Look to the east. But it didn't work at all in this movie because the job was effectively finished once the Dreadnought went down. I mean, sure, there were Mother World spaceships flying around and they were kind of a nuisance, but the big major threat was already destroyed. That'd be like if Luke destroyed the Death Star and then the rebels flew in at the last second to destroy all the remaining TIE fighters. You see how boring and dumb that sounds? So apparently the young princess that Korra shot survived. For the princess is still alive. So at the end of this movie, the good guys are like, yeah, we should probably try and find her and uh, defeat the Mother World in the process. Let's do it, gang. And then the movie ends. Wow. I'm honestly astonished how bad these movies were narratively. I'm not joking when I say that I could write something better, and I normally never say that. Anyway, that's my review of the Rebel Moon movies. Let me know what you thought of them in the comment section down below. I apologize to all the Snyder fans out there that are definitely no longer watching at this point anyway, but whatever. Thank you so much to all the people that support me on Patreon. That's gonna do it for this video. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed, and I'll see you in the next one. Bye. <laughs> Do it, kill her!